verses 18, 9 through 15. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There, in the tent, she said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. There was a movie... Uh gosh, probably almost 20 years ago, called Stigmata. And uh, in the movie, a Catholic priest is having a conversation with an agnostic young woman in a restaurant. And uh, they're talking about something, and she kind of looks at him strange uh, as he talks about something that happened in his past and in his life before he was a priest. And she looks at him strangely, and he just kind of looks back at her and says, you know, I wasn't born a priest, right? Basically saying, you know, I... I I've made mistakes too. I've done things too. And there's some stories that I feel like may be helpful in understanding, in, 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 uh, in helping us understand this, the, uh, some scriptures that, that I could tell that might be helpful in understanding that I might feel like I sometimes need to preface, you know, I wasn't born a pastor, okay? So back when I was, uh, back in my younger days, when I was in college, there was this girl, and we ended up getting together one weekend, but there was a problem. I already had a girlfriend, you know, so that's a problem. It was not one of my finer moments. It's something that I'm not proud of. Um, but there was another problem, too. I didn't know it, but this girl had developed a reputation for kind of picking off other girls' boyfriends. And uh, I was number three that semester. And about a week later, she met number four. And um, when she had, she had lost interest. And I say all this to say, sometimes there is more to the story than you can see. Most of us have experienced this. The person that you think is just a complete jerk until you hear their story and you realize they're just hurting inside. Anybody ever had that experience before? You think, man, this person, there's something really wrong with this person. I can't stand this person. And then you hear their story and you, you begin to feel, feel bad for the person. See, this girl had just come off of a three-year high school uh, relationship with this guy who dumped her right before he went off to college uh, because he didn't want to be tied down. And she felt like she had kind of thrown away her entire high school for this guy who had left her. And, and she's trying to basically, she's dealing with a lot of insecurity. And she's basically kind of trying to, to make up for lost time. And there's usually more to the story than we can see. You know, if you don't learn anything else from this story this morning, know, know this, right? That guy at work, that horrible neighbor, that mean teacher, that obnoxious kid, you don't know what's going on in the privacy of their own homes. You don't know what's going on in the privacy of their own heads. And try to remember that. We should try to remember that. We should try to be a little bit more patient. We should try to be a little bit more kind. We should try to remember that if it hadn't been for the grace of God, now, that would be us, too. We would be no different if it hadn't been for the grace of God. And just like there is more to most people that we meet, there's more to their stories, there is more to this story than what we see here uh, in, in chapter 18. Because this is just a small piece of a larger story about Abraham. There is more going on in Sarah's life and in Abraham's life here than just the outward actions that they're portraying. There is a lot of stuff going on in their heads and in their minds, kind of behind the scenes that we have to, it's here in scripture, and, and we can understand it, we can see see it here in scripture, but we have to dig a little bit deeper to understand what's going on in their heads, what, what, what's, where's their motivations, what's, what's causing this, uh, what's causing all of this to happen. Most of us know from Sunday school, right, from our Sunday school days, most of us know back in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham believes God and it's credited to him as righteousness, right? And then we go forward a, a chapter and Sarah laughs at God, right? So Abraham believes God. It's credited to him as righteousness. Sarah laughs at God, and she's kind of reprimanded for it here. Except that's not the entire story. If you look back at Genesis 17, this is something I didn't even realize until I was studying out 
this, this passage as I was reading through Genesis, preparing for this series, something I didn't even realize. Did you know Abraham laughed at God too? Now, not in the same way as Sarah. We're going to see that. But Abraham laughs too. All the way back, Genesis chapter 17, verse 17, it says God has just given his promise to Abraham. says, you're going to have a child. I know you're 100 years old, but you're going to have a child, and you're going to be the father of a great nation, of many nations. And it says in Genesis 17, 17, it says, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? So Abraham laughs too. And he almost uses, not exactly the same words, and that's going to be important. We're going to look at the words that they use and see how that shows the heart that's behind what, what they're doing here. But, but he uses very similar words to what Sarah says. He says, shall a, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And Sarah says, after I am old and worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Same basic idea. Abe is as old as dirt. I am as old as dirt, right? And this is not going to happen. So why is Sarah reprimanded and Abraham is not? Some have actually proposed that it was because she was a woman. They're saying, you know, it's, it's because men, chauvinistic men wrote the Bible. I mean, these are some liberal people that we don't really want to take too, too seriously. You know, the chauvinistic men wrote the Bible and they hated women. I don't think that's the case. Uh, I mean, I get it. There were plenty of bad attitudes toward women back in the ancient world. There, there were. And, and that doesn't mean that God has a bad attitude towards women. God, God is, is the one. Jesus is the one who came down and broke a lot of these, a lot of these uh, stereotypes and a lot of these things. Jesus empowered women when he was on earth. He empowered women to be a part of his ministry. They were an essential part of his ministry as, as, he, as he ministered in, the, in, in, in Israel back when, he was, back when he was on earth with us, Right? But, but some have suggested that this is it. I don't think that's really the case. Um, some have suggested maybe that it had to do that, that since Sarah was the one that was going to be carrying the baby, it was more important for her to have faith. Or maybe she should have known. Maybe she should have been more in tune with what God was doing in her body. I mean, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of that there. But I, I really still, I still don't think that's it. I think, as is usually the case with Scripture, it's the heart that makes the difference. It's not, it's not the outward actions of Abraham and Sarah that mattered so much. It's the heart behind them. Right? The, the, the Bible says in 1 Samuel, it says that, that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Just like back in college, me and that girl were both horrible to each other. We were completely dysfunctional at that point in my life. Right? But the heart behind the actions was very different. She did what she did out of anger and frustration. I did what I did because she reminded me of a girl that I very much did not want to leave behind back up in New York. So same stupidity, same dysfunction, right? but very, very different reasons. And I think the same kind of thing is going on here with Abraham and Sarah. Right? They're both struggling to believe. They're both struggling with doubt. It's the same dysfunction. Right? But there's a very different heart behind what's, what's going on here. And so let's dive in and let's look at that this morning. A couple of things that we can see in this passage, I think, that will help us to get at the heart of what's going on in Abraham and Sarah's mind and help us to understand what is this passage of Scripture saying to us? How do I deal with doubt? How do I deal with those moments where I'm struggling to believe? And what does God, how does God deal with me in those moments? How does God, is God just, just waiting to call me out like he is with Sarah? Or is there something else going on? Is there hope? Is there, is there, is there understanding in, in those moments for me? And so let's look here. Let's start with, uh, with, uh, with the first thing here, Abraham's first reaction to God. So God says, where is Sarah, your wife? Abraham says she is in the tent. In verse 10, the Lord said, he gives them the promise, I will surely return about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, and she laughs. And what does Abraham do? I mean, Abraham, back in chapter 17, it says, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself. Abraham fell on his face back in chapter 17. And that's important because when I, when I read this, I immediately thought about falling on your face in worship. So many times in the Old Testament when, 
when it says that somebody fell on their face, it's followed by the phrase in worship. They're falling on the, he's not just tripping and falling down, right? Abraham's not being clumsy here. He's falling down in worship. And if we're not sure, because it doesn't say the word worship here in, in verse 17, but if we're not, not 100% sure, we can actually go back. We can interpret Scripture according to Scripture. That's a great principle for us as we're studying the Bible on our own. When we've got a passage of Scripture we're not 100% clear on, we interpret that passage of Scripture according to what the rest of Scripture says. Does that make sense? So if we've got a passage, I'm not really sure what that means. There's a passage in Romans, I think it's chapter 5, where Paul writes, all, uh, and through Adam all have, have died, and through, or through Adam all have fallen, and through Christ all are redeemed. And so the question is, there are some people that have used that passage to say, look, you don't actually need to believe in Jesus. Everybody's redeemed in Jesus. But when you interpret Scripture by Scripture, and if you took that little verse out and just used that little verse, you can maybe make a case that it says that. But if you interpret Scripture by Scripture, you look at what the rest of the Bible says, you look at what the rest of the Apostle Paul says, even right there in the book of Romans, just a few verses away, it's clear that Paul is saying that all who are in Adam, which is all of us, all of us are, are children of Adam. All of us are, are members of the human race, have fallen. But all who are in Christ, only those who are in Christ are, are redeemed. And we have to do the same thing here. So it looks like, it seems like he's probably falling on his face in worship. We don't, we don't know for sure because it doesn't have the word in worship. But when we read through the Old Testament, what we see is that almost every time this phrase for falling on your face is used. It's followed by the word in worship. And there's one exception, and this one exception is, is hugely helpful to us. Just a few verses earlier in chapter 17, God appears to Abraham, and it says Abraham falls on his face. And that's all it says, right? And so it's obvious, it's, it's clear, it's obvious here that Abraham is falling on his face in worship. It's not that God's appearing to him and he's clumsy, right? He's falling on his face in worship. It's obvious when you go back to verse 3. And so when we fast forward to verse 17, and it uses the same phrase, I think it's obvious that it's, he's falling on his face in worship. And so what we see here is, is Abraham falls on his face in worship, and then he does laugh. He does struggle with doubt. But even though he's struggle with, struggling with doubt, Abraham is recognizing who's speaking here. And that's the important point. He's recognizing who he's talking to. He's recognizing this is the God of the universe that is worthy of his worship. He's understanding that this is the God of the universe who he should fall on his face before because he's not worthy to stand before this God. And so even though Abraham is struggling with doubt this morning, he's recognizing who God is. He's standing before God. He's bowing before God in reverence and in worship. And he's saying, okay, I'm struggling here. I'm trying to believe. I want to believe. Please help me out here. And I don't think that's the same place that Sarah's in. Because while Abraham is trying to approach God with the reverence and the faith that he deserves, when we look at Sarah's story in Genesis chapter 18, we see something, Sarah does something that's a little bit troubling to us here. Sarah lies about it, right? That's number two, Sarah lies. And there's a lot of significance in this lie here because all, all lying is, is wrong. Right? All lying is a problem. But Sarah's lying to God here. And do you see what the problem is here? Abraham is recognizing who he's talking to, right? He's recognizing, I'm talking to the God of the universe who is worthy of my worship. Sarah lies to this all-knowing God. She clearly does not know who she's talking to. Or if she does know who she's talking to, she, she doesn't really care, or maybe she's trying to get away with something. I don't know. Right? But she clearly, it's like when I was a teacher's assistant at, uh, at uh, an elementary school. And these two kids were bickering and fighting and, and, you know, with each other. And finally I had enough. I, I went up to them. I said, you need to stop it. And so they're just kind of you know, bickering back and forth. And one of them turns to me kind of without thinking and starts talking to me the same way he was talking to that other kid. And I just looked at him and said, oh, wait, wait, wait. I think you just forgot who you were talking to. Right? There's one thing if you want to talk to him that way. But I'm a teacher's assistant. You know, I think you just forgot who you're talking to. Right? And I think that's what's happening with Sarah here. 
God's like, you, 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 uh, you laughed. And Sarah's like, no, 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 I didn't laugh. God's like, no, I think you just forgot who you're talking to. Right? I am the God of the universe. I see everything. I hear everything. Don't tell me you didn't laugh. It's like the kid with the cookie jar, you know. He's in the kitchen, sitting on the counter. The cookie jar's open. There's crumbs everywhere. His streaks are puffed out, you know. And then you're like, what are you doing eating cookies? I don't eat any cookies, you know. Sarah either doesn't know who she's talking to or she doesn't really care who she's talking to. Abraham is coming from a place of reverence and yeah, maybe a little bit of doubt. But Sarah is not. The third thing I think that's really key in this passage, Sarah uses the word old. And I know what you're thinking. Right? Some of you are looking back, checking at Genesis chapter 17 and you're, and you're looking and you're saying, oh no, no, look, Abraham does too. Look at verse 17. And, and, and in, in, the, in the English... Yeah, in the English, it says, uh, it says, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Right? But that's how we talk in English. That's how we speak in English. That's how we would say it in, in our language. In the Hebrew, literally it says, shall a child be born to a 100-year to man? He's not saying he's old. Right? He's not making a, a, a statement of opinion here about his ability to have a child. He's asking a question. He's saying, I'm 100. I'm a 100-year man, as, they, as it would say in Hebrew. I'm a 100-year man. I'm a man of 100 years. Is a child really going to be born to a man of 100 years? I'm asking because I want to know. I'm not doubting. I'm not, I'm not rebelling against you. I'm just saying, like, I'm, I'm trying to see it. I want to see it, but I'm struggling right now. That's not what Sarah says. Sarah says straight up in the Hebrew, she says, Abraham is old. And more than that, that, that word old can also mean worn out, right? So, so literally she's saying, Abraham is old and worn out. In other words, this is not going to happen, right? I mean, in a sense, she's saying, look, this stuff just isn't working anymore, right? His, his body is not working the way that you designed the human body to work. It's just not going to happen. I think Abraham is asking an honest question. I think when he says, how can this be? He's saying, how can this be? Right? He really wants to know. Now, I believe you can do it. I just, it's beyond my understanding. I just don't see it. I want to see it. Help me to see it. Kind of like the disciples. When Jesus asked the disciples if they believed, and one of them said, yes, we, I believe. Help my unbelief. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to believe. I want to believe. I believe you are who you said you are. I believe you're going to do what you say you're going to do. But sometimes it's just a little bit hard for us, isn't it? Anybody ever struggle with that before? I believe God is who he says he is. I believe he's going to do what he says he's going to do. But sometimes as we look in the physical world around us, sometimes it's just hard to see how it's going to work out. And what's so great about this passage is God doesn't mention anything to Abraham about it. I mean, now Sarah laughs. God says, you laughed. You shouldn't have laughed. Sarah says, I didn't laugh. God says, oh, oh yeah, you did laugh. And he leaves it at that, so he's still, he's still being nice there. But God doesn't mention anything to Abraham about his laughter because he sees the heart behind it. He knows that while Sarah is laughing from a place of doubt and a place of disbelief, Abraham is laughing from a place of struggle, right? from a place of of, of desiring to believe, of wanting to believe, but he's just a little bit weak. And sometimes that's us too. We want to believe. We want to follow, but sometimes we're weak. And it's good to know that God doesn't hold Abraham's weakness against him in the same way that he holds Sarah's rebellion against her. He doesn't even mention it to Abraham. And it's the same thing with us. Tim Keller, uh, who, who wrote that book uh, that I gave to our graduates, um, Tim Keller tells a story about, he said, when the Israel, or he's just talking about the, uh, the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. And he says, when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, some of them probably just marched confidently across. Like, we, are, we have got this. We are, we are. Like, there is nothing that's going to touch me. Kind of like this guy.
right? I mean, can you see that, right? Some of the Israelites probably just like, we got this, you know? God, God's got this. He is going to deliver us. There's not a doubt in my mind. And I imagine other of the Israelites, this is what Tim Keller said, and I think he's right. I imagine some of the other Israelites, they could barely put one foot in front of the other. They're like, I just know any second this water's just going to come crashing down on me. Any gust of wind they felt, any, any kind of uh, sound that they heard out of the ordinary, they're just, you know, cowering. But they made it across. And Tim Keller makes this point that, that they all made it across. The ones with the strong faith that just, that just marched through like, like nothing was going wrong. The ones that were, that were terrified but still made it through, still put their faith in God. They all made it across. And it brings up this great point. He says that their salvation was not in the strength of their faith. Their salvation was in the strength of their God. And our salvation this morning is not in the strength of our faith. Now we have to have faith. But Jesus said faith like a mustard seed is all that we need. And, and he wants to give us more faith, and I think it's good. We should pray for more faith, and we should desire more faith, and we should read the Word and meet together with God's people so that we grow in our faith. But we, just, we, we have to remember that our salvation is not just in the strength of our faith. It's in the strength of our God. Amen. And so if you take a faith like Abraham's right now that's a little bit weak and a little bit struggling, it's not quite where it needs to be. Now, we're going to see. We're going to start seeing as we go further on in these stories. Abraham's faith is going to get stronger and stronger until he is a, a pillar of faith at the end of his life. But if we right now, we take a faith like Abraham's, that's not the strongest, that's struggling a little bit, that's doubting a little bit, but we put that faith in a strong God. Right? That's, that's, that's important. That's where our salvation is found. Even Abraham. Our example of faith, his salvation is not in the strength of his faith. It is in the strength of his God. And so I think when we put all this together, we see this one kind of principle that emerges. And that's the fourth thing. We see that kind of the conclusion. Abraham is asking an honest question because he wants to understand. But Sarah is raising an objection because she doesn't believe. And I'm not saying she doesn't believe in God. I'm not saying she dies a faithful woman. And, uh, but at this moment, she's kind of written the promise off. And for whatever reason, in this moment, she's not believing. And this is a great place to turn it back to us this morning. And ask ourselves the question, where are we? Are you one of those who's struggling to understand? If you're one of those that's struggling to understand, that's good. You've come to the right place. God is patient with us. He gently, patiently leads us. We looked at Hosea chapter 11 a few weeks ago, and I just want to remind you of that. Hosea 11, 3 and 4. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to feed them. Are you struggling this morning? Are you weak this morning? Did this week not go quite the way you had hoped it would go? Is there some stuff that you regret? God is patient. God knows that our minds are weak and he works with us and he works in us and he molds us and he shapes us, and he makes us more like his son. And we're going to start seeing that in the life of Abraham. You know, these first five, six chapters of Abraham's life have kind of been a little bit of, a, they've been a picture of faith, but they've been a picture of, of struggling faith. They've been a picture of a guy who, who believes and who wants to follow, but who's struggling to work out how, how all this works out in his daily life because he comes from a background of idol worship. He comes from a background where he didn't know God. And he's trying to learn who God is and who God wants him to be. And we're going to start seeing, though, as we move on past chapter 18 or into chapter 18 and, and through chapter 18 and beyond, we're going to start seeing Abraham growing and Abraham really becoming this pillar of faith, this pillar of strong faith. But if you're not there yet, if you're, if you're more a Genesis chapter 12 or a Genesis chapter 13 kind of Abraham right now, that's okay. God's working in you. God's molding in you. God's shaping you. And he's going to continue to do that. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3, he writes, talking about the Messiah, talking about Jesus. This is a bruised reed he will not break. I don't know if you are familiar with the, the idea of a bruised reed. I, I grew up in a, in a town that was kind of surrounded by swamplands. And you have these, these uh, we call them cattails, these reeds with these kind of brown, weird 
things on top of them, and they would they would grow up, you know, probably almost as tall as as a, as a human, maybe you know, five feet tall, and they would kind of sway in the wind. But if one ever got broken, all you had to do was just just you know they would bend with the wind. But if they broke to a certain point. It was done. It was over. That was the weakest thing you can imagine. That's what he's talking about here. A bruised reed. Can you imagine anything weaker than a bruised reed? This is a bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. Like a candle that's about to go out. Matthew takes these passages, or these words from Isaiah and he applies them to Jesus. And you know, in our culture today, there's a lot of people that kind of have this weak, kind of girly view of Jesus. You know, you've seen it in the movies where he's kind of floating around and he kind of talks with a high voice. Right? And, and in our culture today, in response to that, there, there are some others who have come up with this like super manly, ultimate fighting version of Jesus, right? You know? And, and I think there's kind of problems on either side. You know, Jesus was a man. He was a man's man. And sometimes Jesus was harsh and demanding with people. Sometimes he was. I mean, he told the rich young ruler to take a hike. You know, at one point, Peter, Peter argues with him. His right-hand man, he calls him Satan. He spit on a blind guy. He called a woman a dog and told her he didn't want to heal her son. He made a whip. I mean, I'm kind of exaggerating here, but he made a whip and started tearing stuff up and beating people in church. But he was also very tender. He was a friend of sinners and prostitutes. He held little children in the highest regard in a culture where children were expendable. Jesus really did love the little children. He loved the unlovable. He cared for those who couldn't help themselves. He healed those who, who had nothing. But Jesus has no time for outright rebellion like Sarah, like with Sarah. But weakness, struggle, doubt, that's something Jesus will work with. If you feel like you're bruised and about to break this morning, if you feel like the fire is about to be snuffed out, you're right in a place where, we, where he can help you. Don't be the one who's constantly throwing up objections like, like Sarah. Don't be the one who's, always, who's constantly saying, well, I've always thought. Well, Sarah always thought 90 was too old to have a baby. But guess what? God thought differently. Well, I could never believe in a God who would allow so much suffering in the world. I get that. I get that. But, but what would you have him do? I mean, I look around and most of the suffering in the world I see isn't God's fault. It's our fault. It's the stuff that we're doing to each other. So would you rather have God just wipe everything out? Because that's really the only other way. At least in this age that we live in now, you want to get rid of suffering in the world, you got to get rid of people. That's the way I see it. I think that's the way Scripture sees it. But God is patient. God is kind. Not wanting any to perish, but waiting, giving opportunity for all of us to come to repentance. Giving opportunity for all of us to begin to learn to see life his way and to begin to learn to do life his way. And when we begin to learn to do life his way, when we live a life of love and of mercy and of compassion and of passion and purpose and righteousness and justice and mercy like he wants us to live, then we will see the suffering begin to go out of this world. And God is patient with us and he is kind and he's waiting for us and he's helping us and he's working with us. So keep struggling to understand. That's good. Keep studying. Keep praying. Keep repenting. Keep hanging in there. Keep struggling with your faith. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep asking God to help you. Don't give up hope. Don't be like Sarah. Don't give God a bunch of reasons why he can't do what he's promised to do. Because he can do it and he will do it. God is either going to accomplish his purposes through you or he'll accomplish his purposes in spite of you. And for right now in Sarah's life, now Sarah's going to come around, but for right now in Sarah's life, he's going to have to, for a few moments here, accomplish his purposes in spite of Sarah. And I think that's true for us. We don't want to be that. We want to be like Abraham. We want to be the person whom God accomplishes his purposes through, not who God accomplishes his purpose in spite of. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you.